Stand this one with me by call to worship and prayer. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to his o Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in his holy splendor. Come to worship the Lord in the glory of his presence. We come to worship him in the beauty of his sanctuary. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over the mighty waters. We come to hear the voice of the Lord. Speak to us, Lord, in your voice is full of death. You me in prayer. Holy God, we come to you this morning, following the example of our Lord. As we remember his baptism, help us to recommit ourselves to following him. Empower us by the water and by the spirit. This is the great of the Lord. Amen. The main stand for him number eight. share the message that God is impartial, that justice and peace are God's intention for all humans and humankind. We combine our individual efforts through the church, joining in programs, projects, and outreach that reflect God's life 
into the world are gifts of gratitude by one way of sharing. Uh, the flesh and the center and the back. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be here in your house this morning. We thank you for every blessing that you give us. We thank you for the blessing that we can give back to you and to your church. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for sometimes we should be more grateful. Thank you, Lord. Again, this time to worship you, Lord, many times. As you bless these. Now, the children will come forward. Sister Kathy Robinson has the children's message. Come to the time in our service for the consecration of church leadership uh, for the next year. And much of this consecration service is taken from pages uh, 226 through, excuse me, 326 through 328 of For All Who Minister. 
In the church of the brethren, sisters and brothers are ordained for ministry at the time of their baptism. The church also calls out people with gifts for specific ministry tasks. This congregation, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, has called many individuals for leadership among us. Today we join in a service of consecration, commissioning those whom we have called for ministry. I invite you to pray. Oh God, we give thanks for all people here who have responded to your call in Christ Jesus to be workers together with you. We are especially grateful for our brothers and sisters who express their faith and witness through the specific ministries of this congregation. Grant us grace that we may all present our gifts and talents to be used for your glory and our neighbor's good. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we begin this service of consecration, I would ask that the, those whose names I call, recognizing their call in the service, to please stand where you are. The church board and its commissions give direction to the congregation's mission and ministry. In church council on November 13th, Debbie Humphrey, Mary St. John, and Billy Altus were called to this ministry. Cindy Montgomery and Betsy St. John were called to a second term on the church board. They joined with those who were called by previous council meetings and continued their service to the church. Those who continue to serve include Fred Anderson, Kathy Plunkett, Jim Warlock, Sam St. John, Ron Sink, Janice Sink, Shannon Quinn, Kristen Marco, and Kathy Robertson. Debbie Humphrey, Charles Flora, Steve Walker, and Billy Altus continue their service as trustees. Buck Singh continues his service as the deacon chairperson. In addition to serving those serving on the church board, you have also called your next pastor, Pam Singh. Charles Flora and Pat Fryer to serve as your district conference delegates. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God has called you to these ministries in our congregation. We thank God for each of you and your willing response to this call. We believe that God will empower you for this ministry among us. Therefore, we invite you to make your commitment by responding to these questions of commission which I will ask on behalf of this congregation. Do you willingly accept the responsibility to which you have been called? And do you promise to be faithful in fulfilling that responsibility? If so, respond, we do. Will you seek to live a life worthy of this trust, exemplifying Christian faith and spirit in all that you do? If so, please respond, we will. Will you be creative, redemptive, and cooperative as you work together in the common tasks? If so, respond, we will. Will you prepare yourself by becoming familiar with congregational, district, and denominational policies and ministries? And will you prepare yourself through regular Bible study, prayer, worship, and sharing in the life of this faith community? If so, please respond, we will. Brothers and sisters in the rest of our congregation, do you as sisters and brothers in Christ affirm the call as leaders of those called by the church to serve this congregation? Do you offer that <clears throat> your cooperation and confidence, your prayers and support, so that both the knowledge and love of God revealed in Jesus Christ may increase among us and in all of God's creation? If so, please respond, we do, we do. As your co-worker in Christ, I declare you installed as leaders, workers, and delegates of the Ninth Street Church of the Brethren, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May you see. Before we continue in worship, I believe it is appropriate for us to honor those 
who have served us previously in roles of church leadership and have completed their terms of service in the past year. Rosemary Palmer, Jeff Montgomery, and Caleb Quinn have completed terms on the church board. Peggy Webster has completed her term as district conference delegate, and Dana Wright has completed her term as annual conference delegate. I invite you, brothers and sisters, to recognize their commitment to Christ and the church at this time. We have several offices in the life of the church that remain open. And for those who feel the nudging of the Spirit to serve Christ in the church through the administration of our congregation, there are two positions on the church board available at the present time. We also are seeking an annual conference delegate for 2023. If you are interested in either of those positions, please see Sister Pam Singh, our church board chair, uh, for more information. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your willingness to hear the call of Christ and serve our church. Uh, we'll turn to our hymn books right now and sing John General Shepherd to come and lead us on 352. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh God, as we come once again to the example of our Savior and our Lord, help us to remember our own baptism and to recommit ourselves to the promises that we made by water and by spirit. All this we pray in the name of our Savior and our Lord. Amen. There are a few moments in the life of the church that are cause for greater celebration. The new believers entering the waters of baptism, taking their vows, making their profession of faith, Accepting the grace of our Lord Jesus and beginning new lives as his followers. Baptism marks not only a major milestone in the life of the individual believer, it also marks an important milestone in the life of the whole congregation. Welcoming new believers into full fellowship in the congregation is a sign of life and vitality. It signifies the promise that we, the community of faith, are making to the new disciple to be, for her or for him, a place of nurture, love, and Christian support. These promises are not entered into lightly, either on the part of the new believer or on the part of the church. And yet, for all of the heaviness of the vows taken, the budding of the gospel message into the life of a new believer is, is something that those of us who have been following Jesus for a long time should celebrate and rejoice with. When brethren think about baptism, there are four main scripture passages that come to mind. Perhaps one of the first is the Great Commission. 
where Jesus commands his disciples to go and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. Another passage that quickly comes to mind is the response of the crowd to Peter's preaching at Pentecost in Acts 2, where they ask him what they should do, and Peter responds that they should repent and be baptized so that their sins may be forgiven and that they would receive the Holy Spirit. The third passage that we often evoke concerning baptism comes from Romans chapter 6, where Paul speaks of being united with Christ's death through baptism, and therefore being raised with him in resurrection as we emerge from the waters. From these passages, we come to understand that baptism is a choice entered into by someone old enough to decide for him or herself to follow Jesus. We also understand that baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual transformation, and that baptism is the beginning, not the end, of our journey of following Jesus. But while these passages have much to teach us about Christian baptism, I believe that as followers of Jesus, we should go straight to the source, the words and the actions of our Lord and Savior. And the clearest record of what Jesus has to teach us about baptism comes in the story of his own baptism, found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As John the Baptist began his ministry in Matthew chapter 3, crowds flocked to him in the wilderness, and he preached the baptism for the repentance of sin. Far from being satisfied with a mere ritual observance, John challenged the crowds, but especially the religious leaders, not just to receive the outward sign, but to bear fruit that demonstrates their inward change of heart. While John clearly understood the baptism that he was offering as one that was received as a sign of repentance from sin, it almost begs the question for us, why would Jesus, whom the Bible tells us was without sin, need to receive a sign of repentance? Apparently, John struggled with that same question, because when Jesus came to him to be baptized, John protested, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? John's concern, consistent with this earlier foreshadowing of the one who would come after him be greater than he, is that he recognized that Jesus the one standing before him asking to be baptized was indeed the Messiah. The one prophesied to come, the one who John had been speaking about, who was greater than he. Why was the one who was to come now submitting himself for a baptism? That's... Jesus responded to John's concerns by saying, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. What does Jesus mean when he says that this was proper to fulfill all righteousness? Is Jesus referring to a sense of obligation that he is somehow required to be baptized? I do not believe that to be the case. Instead, I believe that when Jesus speaks of fulfilling all righteousness, Jesus is speaking of being in right relationships. It is fulfilling all righteousness for Jesus to be baptized, submitting himself to God for his ministry to come. It is fulfilling all righteousness for Jesus to set an example for those who would follow after him. That we, like our Lord and Savior, should make the outward and visible sign of our inward and spiritual commitment. 
And it is also fulfilling all righteousness. For Jesus to receive the ministry of his cousin John, whom God has sent before him to prepare the way. From this exchange between Jesus and John, he gained one very important insight about baptism. The efficacy of baptism is based upon the faith confessed by the person who is receiving the sign of baptism and the spirit of Christ Jesus that is found present in the community of faith who witnesses the baptism and embraces the new believer who emerges from the water. Without that faith and without the spirit of Christ express, expressed in the community, baptism has no more effect than making the person exceptionally wet. There is nothing magical about the water that we fill up this basin behind us with. It is simple tap water passed through the hot water heater to an exceedingly warm temperature and allowed to cool in order to be comfortable. The magic, the spiritual transformation comes there for not from the water that comes out of that pipe, but from the promises received by those persons who enter into the water and declare their faith in Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. The effectiveness of baptism also has absolutely nothing to do with the relative holiness or lack of holiness of the person performing the ordinance. Through the years, I have heard many stories from persons who were baptized by pastors who later left the ministry in disgrace following serious ethical misconduct. Some of those persons have even questioned their own faith and the efficacy of their baptism. I've also heard other stories from persons who were baptized by beloved leaders in the church, larger than life figures who we continue to look up to even years after their death. Many of you remember our beloved brother, Bob Jennings, who served as camp manager for many years and associate district executive. Shortly before Brother Bob passed away, my wife, Tabitha, happened to be the last person that he baptized. That's a lovely piece of trivia. But the important mark of Brother Bob's life in Tabitha is found in the ministry and the teaching, the example that he set. Not that he was the one who put her under water a few times. The effect of baptism comes from the commitment of the one who has been baptized to follow Jesus. It is renewed day by day as we make the conscious decision to continue to follow Jesus and to continue to grow in our discipleship. The pastor who performs a baptism does so on behalf of Christ and the church, and the person who receives the baptism receives the grace and holiness of Jesus. Not the grace and holiness of the pastor, nor the grace and holiness of the church. Jesus' example of being baptized by John demonstrates this. As they, drawn by their shared trust in God, enter the waters. As Matthew continues, he tells us that when Jesus came up from the waters, Suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and alighting on him. Matthew is not particularly clear about whether Jesus alone saw and experienced the Spirit of God descending upon him, or whether John and the others present at the river saw it as well. I tend to believe that from Matthew's words, he saw that this mystical experience was only was something that only Jesus understood as it was occurring. Either way, the Spirit descending upon Jesus 
coupled with the voice of God saying, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased, gets at the most important aspect of Jesus' baptism for him personally. Jesus' baptism was the beginning of his public ministry. It was the confirmation that God was at work in him and through him. The Gospels are silent on what was going on in Jesus' life from the time he was 12 until he appeared in the Jordan Valley to be baptized. While we do not know for sure what Jesus was doing, I believe it is safe to assume that he was living a somewhat normal life in Nazareth, working in the carpentry trade, trade and going about his daily routine. The Gospels are also pretty silent about what prompted Jesus, the journey to the Jordan Valley to be baptized, and to submit himself to the Spirit of God that would lead him into the wilderness. While Jesus did not have any sin to repent of, his baptism, like ours, represented a major change in his life. By water and by the Spirit, Jesus' baptism was his ordination into public ministry. The actions of God in sending the Spirit and in confirming Jesus' call would give further support to the path that Jesus had already served for himself. From this example of our Savior, we receive the instruction that baptism is not merely a saving act or the sign of transformation in our private lives. Baptism is an ordination into the general ministry of the land. In the Church of the Brethren, we believe that every professed Christian is called into this ministry through our baptism. We are called into a life of prayer, Bible study, growth, and discipleship. We are called to nurture and support the faith of our fellow believers. We often express this call as a call to be Christ Jesus to one another and to our neighborhood and our world. And we are also called for our baptism in both word and action to show the grace, the love, and the mercy of Christ Jesus in a hurting world. Sometimes this demonstration of grace takes the form of sharing our faith with those who do not yet know Jesus. Sometimes this demonstration of love and grace takes the form of a cold cup of water or a helping hand to one in need. Sometimes this demonstration of grace and mercy is as simple as a listening ear and the sign to another that somebody cares. When John the Baptist spoke of bearing fruit worthy of repentance, I believe, brothers and sisters, that this is the next step that he was talking about. Bearing fruit worthy of repentance will not only draw our personal lives closer to God, it will not only make us more holy as individuals. The next step of the Holy Spirit transforming our lives and our hearts is to fulfill all righteousness by embracing the call to support and nurture others in their walk with Jesus. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus set us a powerful example to follow. The heart of what it means to be a Christian if we boil it down to the simple core, it's about following Jesus. It's not about merely professing a certain set of beliefs. It's not about merely supporting the right causes. It is about actively and faithfully learning from Jesus and with the help of the Holy Spirit going and doing likewise. In his baptism, Jesus told John that it was right for him to do this. To fulfill all righteousness. In our own baptism, we affirmed our belief in Jesus as our Savior and our promise to follow Him as our Lord. Our question 
which must be answered each day, is are we confirming with our words and our actions the promises that we have already made by water and by the Spirit? Speaking of those promises that we have already made as we respond to the message of our Lord, let us stand together and sing hymn number 447. Let us go out to follow Jesus.